<laughs> but I am here today um, with a gentleman who has um, worn many hats. Um, you have got a podcast that you recently started. Um, you're an author of two books. And you've got a lot of other secrety things going on in the background that in the future, later on, after this podcast has been released, the world will know about uh, when they follow you on the various uh, platforms and etc. So I'm here with David. I should have asked how to pronounce your surname. Is it Kerfis? It is. It's oh, wonderful. It means visible, uncurable disease. Wow. Yes. That, that is pretty damn cool. And yeah. so um, you basically, um, you start a podcast recently uh, that people can find on YouTube. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it actually is and why you started a podcast? Yeah, man. So the podcast is the easiest way to summarize it is it was my way to find joy in life. Um, I needed to connect my passions and I couldn't do it through my day job. I love writing, but I still wasn't getting the release I needed mentally. I could work out all day long. It wasn't clearing. So I had to find a way to clear my my consciousness and de-stress. And music has always been my go-to escape route when I feel like shit. Um, and I'm also a pretty big mental health advocate. And I just came up with this idea to kind of fuse the two. So I came up with the uh, We Are Melomaniacs podcast. And, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy it. And it's turned out to be the most passionate thing I'm doing. So I just get on. I find musicians who are willing to open up, completely vulnerable. And we talk about the shit that's happened in our life, both good and bad, and how music has been there for us. So it, it's really just a life journey between me and other artists. Um, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. It's just a mental health and music awareness talk. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things with music is because music is all about expression. You know, it's a very it can be a very personal art form. And I think one of my issues with music, I haven't got any issues with pop music per se, but I don't really like it when you've got loads and loads of different studio artists all kind of making similar-ish sounding music. I'm not as much of a fan of that. I'd much rather something that's weird or different or kind of uh, takes the plunge somewhere, different experimentation and etc. goes like uniqueness i would rather i'd rather a band doesn't unique that isn't that amazing to me than something that i've heard you know a thousand times over and one of the things i think links into that and we'll come back and forth through the podcast because music is so heavily interweaved with it is because i just want to talk about this immediately because i was even talking to you about this before pressing record so i'm just selfishly taking this uh, subject matter is a uh, very well, uh, extreme metal so i like you know Oh, I, I call it genre fluid. You know, I like everything from I like classical, I like pop music, I like uh, male female vocalists, and I like rap as well as heavy metal, death metal, certain deathcore, lots of those things. And some of the individuals you've had on your podcast so far, the music that they release would be considered, you know, on the metal spectrum. So, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about your appreciation of metal from the more sort of uh, the more well known metals, you know, sort of Metallica, Iron Maiden, the kind of the classics and air quotes, to some of the more extreme on the spectrum you know i grew up in a house full of music uh if we weren't playing music in the house we were going to concerts uh both my mom and aunt had a lot of musicians over throughout the years so i had the privilege of meeting musicians and going to shows and everybody that we hung around was into metal mm -hmm. so i was birthed you know, in the metal world, which for the 80s would have been glam rock and classic rock. Uh, but then you had, you know, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, uh, early Havoc, um, Megadeth and so on and so forth. You know, Metallica, which was there from day one. And then, you know, some of the glam music like Molly Crew, mm -hmm. um, War, Kicks, you know, Great White, Cinderella, White Snake. Over the years, as I got older, I started venturing out on my own and finding my own sound. Yes, I loved that stuff I grew up on, but like me, music was morphing. Um, I discovered Alice in Chains and then I discovered Nirvana. So I went through a little grunge phase right about the time I was discovering 90s, like early 90s rap. Then I found heavy metal, like real legit heavy metal. It I would say it was like the early Slayer, but I didn't discover Slayer until later on. I just started finding really heavy music and it fit me 
at the age because I would have been an early teen. I was stressed the fuck out from the stuff going on in my house. You know, my dad wasn't around. Uh, my mom had her boyfriends. We always had parties. The house constantly smelled like fucking weed. And back then, you know, that was the bad drug. You know, there was other shit going on. Um, if there wasn't weed as fucking smoke in the air, there was alcohol and other things. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for me to come home and find blood stains on the wall from fights that broke out. Jesus. Uh, hell, half the time there were holes in the wall from where someone's head or fist went through it. It was a very common thing to come home to the aftermath of a violent evening. Um, and then there were the times I was at my grandparents' house and I could hear my grandmother and father fighting. You know, you could hear the bottle shattering. Well, that develops anxiety in a kid. And when you're young like that, and, you know, being a dude, you know, I was young, I had testosterone. I needed, aggr- I needed aggressive shit. And for me, I found heavy music, uh, early Cannibal Corpse, early Napalm Death, um, eventually Slayer, Sepultura. Then I discovered Machine Head and Fear Factory and just the list goes on and on. New metal comes out. I started dis- discovering new metal, Deftones, Corn, uh, Power Man 5000, Cold Chamber. Um, I just, I needed an outlet and I needed something aggressive that meshed with how I was feeling. And one of the things that people say to me all the time is, dude, you're already high strung. How are you going to listen to metal? You need something to calm you down. Metal does calm me down. Metal is a soothing sound. Like I hear it. And I feel good inside. Like it brings me joy. Like it was my, it was my safety net when there was nothing else. It was my first love. Like as cheesy as that fucking sounds, I was a young kid and I had nowhere to turn. I had music. That music fucking gave me a warm hug. So of course, when I listen to heavy music, I, I feel that. So yes, I do like more chill music, especially now, you know, I'm in my forties and it's nice to, you know, occasionally put on some chill shit. Like I have a very fluid musical uh, genre or taste we should say you know my 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 uh my stream will go from whiskey myers to dawn of ashes to crystal castles to kmfdm to cannibal corpse to cattle decapitation to taylor swift you know nice. uh, and i would like to blame my daughter for the taylor swift but i fucking like taylor swift <laughs> uh, no shame. Not, it, sh- it shouldn't dude. be a shame her reputation album personally is my favorite of hers my fiance adores taylor swift i mean it's funny when i talk to people about my eclectic music taste i find it entertaining because certain people you go you know what kind of music are you into you ask them and they go um oh yeah i'm into everything and i'm like okay so you like you know you like death metal like oh no i don't like that it's like, oh, so you just like heavy metal no no i don't like that do you like any metal or any rock? No, not, not as much. I'm like, well, metal you, takes up such a huge percentage of music, especially if you go to some of the uh, Scandinavian countries in Europe and things. It's like black metal is everywhere. And not just black metal. Obviously, there's other sort of uh, genres and things. But it's like metal for me, as you have very uh, well, you've put it in such an articulate way where I feel that the most calm if, if I need calming down, I listen to heavy music because it's part of the emotional spectrum. You know, when you're feeling sad, you generally people would often listen to sad music, you know? When you're feeling happy and summery, you want that upbeat pop punk music or some of the pop music and things. You kind of want that upbeat thing to keep the buzz going. When you're angry, for some reason, society has this weird thing where they think that anger is one of the few emotions that in music is just not allowed in the mainstream. I think that nowadays things are coming more to it because so many more... Uh, young people especially but like myself as well having spotify and with that the the lines between genres are not as defined you know beforehand i know i'm younger than you are but i still remember going to uh hmv is the shop we had in here in uh, england and buying like metallica's snm cd and being so excited for it because it's a great hit cd and it's got symphony orchestra and i've always loved orchestras and like bands like uh, apocalyptica and things like that so any orchestral movement into them and evanescence in that i love it and i remember going home with a cd and so excited thinking about it going home just sitting there and listening to it for ages and as much as i enjoy spotify and streaming music and the ease as a consumer there is a degree of that difference of having a cd there and and listening to that instead of flipping between things but when you've got these playlists that are kind of a culmination of certain singles and things people like i think that it can spread to pushing the boundaries a little bit if you know because i'm interested with you like if i deep dive a little bit more into as 
you delved into more metal. With me, I didn't like metal to begin with. I liked Muse and Evanescence and things and rap uh, like Eminem and etc. And then my friends really liked Slipknot and I it was too much for me, too heavy. Slipknot, uh, before I forget, I was like, nope, too much. Play on Guitar Hero a lot. And they kept playing it. And I was like, I don't like playing it. It's too much. And then one day it just clicked. And then as soon as it clicked with Slipknot, their uh, third album, and then I got into their first album, which to this day I think is one of the greatest metal albums ever for me personally. From there, it was so much easier to get into the more heavier music with unclean vocals. So I've just thrown a lot at you just then <laughs> about stuff. So I, I thought, starting with the the zooming in on the change of genre from that kind of more 80s glam music to things with a lot more unclean vocals, a lot more shouting, as people may know. Did you find that transition very difficult or was it quite an ease in part? And then you can content everything else I just said. <laughs> well, I fucking loved it. As soon as I heard the first guttural growl, you know, what a lot of people call Cookie Monster Rock, I fucking loved it, man. <laughs> like that. What the fuck are you saying? I love that. I, it went so, like, natural to me. Like, it just resonated. So I, I had no issues going from listening to literally i remember the day i was listening to anthrax sound of white noise with my buddy i think we were we, we were we yeah it was anthrax sound of white noise we literally popped on cannibal corpse the bleeding and i was like what the fuck is this i love it and it was such a transition because anthrax had those super clean vocals but the music was still fairly it's thrashy as fuck then we go straight to Cannibal Corpse, The Bleeding, which I still, I think, is my favorite Cannibal Corpse album. Just so, like, I was like, yes, it's a horror movie, but musical. It's a musical horror movie. Fuck yeah. Like, I just, it went naturally. And then from there, I started looking for more. Um, I, I got really big into Napalm Death. Uh, Utopia Banished was the first album I heard of theirs. Then Fear, Emptiness, Despair. I actually reference Fear, Emptiness, Despair in my novel, the um, one of the chapters. Actually, it's a funny thing about my book. So the title, I'm going to plug myself here. Do it. Do it. So the book itself is called A Thousand Miles to Nowhere. I came up with the title listening to um, Dez's second band because he had cold chamber then he created devil driver devil driver i've seen them yes. live many times had all their albums on cd sorry yes. <laughs> i love no, devil you're driver. Good. no you're absolutely good i could go, like i love it um they put out a, an outlaws album called outlaws to the end and they did a remake of the song a thousand miles from nowhere mm. i just loved it the music the way that first intro like that first chord hit, i was like wait this is it this is it this is this is it like that song title summarized the entire well the plot behind the story not the story but it was the plot um more or less but within the book every chapter is also named after a song so for instance chapter 15 which is first chapter in part two the memory remains metallica nice. you know um my buddy um they're from shit where's he from is he from sweden i think he's from sweden the band's called Misery Loves Company. I gave them a, a track, uh, or a track, I'm assuming, for talking about music, uh, a chapter to, uh, it's all yours. It's a song off their first album. Um, just almost everything in here, like Last Breath, which is the second to last chapter in the book, is after the first hate read song I ever heard. Mm. Absolutely fucking literally fell in love with it. This whole book is like inspired by music and my drama. And my like my loss, like the anxieties I was going through. But to get back to your question, it was really fucking easy to get into metal, the heavier shit. And now I listen to black metal. Like I'm, I really love black metal now. Like I go more toward the atmospheric sound, like Dismal Lyrics. Uh, took. I just interviewed him, and I can't pronounce his band name. Tom Room, mm. um, Volcandra, um, Grima. Then there's shit, man. Wolves in the throne room. Panopticon is probably my favorite. Just I just love the sound, that atmosphere. Death Haven. Uh Death Heaven. Death Haven. Fuck. Death <laughs> Heaven. Dude, I'm t so I can I'll mispronounce my own name if I if I get a chance. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, there are so many. That's the thing with it. It's when you start delving into that that realm, uh, you find that the 
when you get someone who isn't really into uh, heavy music and you play them like black metal and compared to like some death metal and things like that, they really struggle to find the differences. And I've always been, like, you, you really zoom into it. Like we were talking about, you know, hate breed and devil driver, you know, just the sounds of them. People judge the sound devil driver. I'll worship the devil. It's like, well, actually hey, devil driver is actually a, you know, a bell that, which is used to repel demons. So it's actually anti-demon. Um, but you know, and hate breed, obviously it sounds like that as well, but you know, that is like, a so yeah, I, no, I agree completely. I mean, my I think my favorite song of theirs is uh, "In the Ashes We Shall uh, They Shall Rape or We Shall Reap." What well, it was like a single off, um, God, their second or I think it's a third or fourth album. It's just one random song I got in a Metal Hammer magazine on one of those CDs where you used to have like fifteen tracks from different artists. And I used to get into so much music using that. I had so many of those. I know the song. I just can't think of the. Uh, the no, actual- and I'm not going to do a rendition of it, just to clarify. So <laughs> but you, you can just check it out afterwards. But with sort of Spotify and you know CDs and physical media, obviously you're someone who in your pod has mentioned sort of cassettes and things being an earlier part of your life. And moving on, I know that analogs kind of come back. I've got some vinyls myself. Um, there's a Bring Me the Horizon vinyl just over there, and there's a Taylor Swift vinyl, which is my fiance is behind it. So which I'm I'm completely fine with. So like with the physical media have you transitioned into digital have you stuck with analog like what's your general perception of that especially with someone from the perspective of so much metal to delve into so i've talked about this a few times on a couple of different pods Mm -hmm. um i actually got into this conversation last night with the band uh i was interviewing uh i'm not gonna give a spoiler because i'm really excited to announce this when it when it happens this is probably my best pod yet but i i liked i i prefer physical media. Like I love the nostalgia of it. Like I like being able to grab it, open it, pull out the slip, read the lyrics, still fuck them up when I sing them and listen to music and flip it around and find what I'm looking for. Streaming is convenient, but at the same time, it's frustrating. Um, I think you lose some of the audio quality in my opinion. Um, I might be wrong. I don't know. Personally, I think vinyl sounds better than anything. But I like that tangibility. And I think that goes back to music when I was younger. Like there's that safety there. There's that warmth. I'd grab a CD or a cassette. I'd play it. I would drown out the bullshit. I'd get out of my head and I would just chill the fuck out. Same now, man. There's uh, there's nothing better than grabbing a vinyl, going upstairs, spinning it, watching my kids dance around, fucking mosh with each other, you know, and listen to music as a family it just doesn't have the same like i'll play music off my streaming device it's just not the same as when i got the vinyl playing like every every single christmas eve when we open gifts here i spin christmas finals i spin Lindsay sterling's christmas i spin the chipmunks christmas i've got shit my wife loves mariah carey i can't stand that album but it's like <laughs> the pop icon of like the 90s there she absolutely loves the mariah carey christmas album but i like to spend my august burns red christmas nice uh, i actually spent a 150 dollars on their um is it sledden hill i think it's the sledden hill vinyl uh i could be wrong but it's my favorite one uh i hate that i spent 150 bucks on it but you know Whatever. If you love something, you fucking love it. So I completely agree. I mean, right next to me, you would be able to see, but I've got um DVDs and Blu-rays and things, just like I've got I've got this physical media like right next to me. I've got the Tarantino movies and certain films and things that I just I I love. Like this isn't the least air quotes metal, but like I've got the Lego movie, which I love, you know, and it's a steel book. Technically it's metal, so uh, you know, but I, I've got that physical media bug as well. And I got it for vinyls um probably about eight or nine years ago um it was before i was in, in with my fiance and it was funny because i had a lot more disposable income and i was just buying vinyls left right and center for like a year or two i was like any band i really was into i was like i want to buy the vinyl and i had loads of my frame ones and things like that from a, a ton of different ones and i love physically having them as well it, it, it's one of those which i i do love spotify but it's or i say just spotify it sounds like i'm a sponsor um, I, I like streaming and things but the artists obviously don't get enough and that's always a discussion unfortunately is a problem where you can support artists where you can you know try and do it in other ways especially with merchandise but the 
because there's such a platform now, now it's so much easier for artists to come into it. I'm always I have this dissonance about how I would echoes prefer it. You know, do you want every single person to be able to release something and it's a thousand voices shouting in a room? Or do you want it back in the days of like Metallica, which is you just play a few like bars and hope and someone might hear you. And like, I think Metallica got it at one of their first gigs. Someone heard them and they got a record deal. And it's like, what what do you think about the the side of saturation in a market, especially one with uh, metal and other sort of more uh, underground genres? Well, I I see the same thing in the book industry. Um, I'm an indie author. I produced my own book from scratch. Um, there are authors out there who say that if you go indie, you don't have the skill set to be published, which is not true. In my opinion, I chose to go indie because I got to keep my creative rights. Mm -hmm. I got to design my book cover. I got to design the interior. I didn't have to change the interior content. It was my book. The problem with that was I had to market it and I suck Mm -hmm. at marketing. I don't have a PR team. I don't have a marketing team. I'm not established. You can't get into a bookstore either as an indie. They just don't pick you up. Like it is an absolute fucking monopoly for those bigger publishers. Well, the same thing with music. It's, there is an oversaturation of musical artists out there self-producing their music, just like there is with indie writers. There's an oversaturation of writers just producing their own stuff. And it is not all created equal. I personally like to think that I crafted a fucking professional book, but I know that I have had people say that the editing in it is garbage. Right. I don't think it is. It's okay. I've definitely noticed a few spots, but that's just how it is. Even JK Rowling has edit misses. We're human. We make mistakes, but it's not a total bag of trash. You know, like the art is generally unique as fuck. I had. I, I love the artwork of them. To clarify, they're amazing. Thank you very much. So the artwork was done by hand with spray paint. Um, really? Wow! Digital, digital. I did not realize that. That's incredible. Do you see that? That hey, I'm going to zoom in. Do you Do see it. that on the wall right there? Mm-hmm. That's the original art for my book. It's hard to see. I can I can it's see it. There, I can. It's but a, uh, that's the original art. Um, amazing. And I think the same thing goes into play with music. Like, sure, there's more of it out there. Most most of what I end up hearing seems to be pretty good, but there's some stuff I'm like, man, that sounds like shit. Um, <laughs> but most of it is like really really good. Um, you know, at least the stuff I find, or maybe I just don't pay enough attention to the stuff I don't care for. It's convenient, but. It, it takes the fun out of it, man. Like, I was, I, I think I talked about this in the fan episode. Like, there was something to going out to a show and catching that opener and be like, oh, that's fucking good. Or going to the record store and buying a CD because of the cover. Um, it made the music, I don't know, more intimate. So, you know, I can doom scroll all fucking day long on SoundCloud, Spotify, Amazon, uh, YouTube music, and I can find any number of bands and land on them. I mean, hell, that's how I found Creeping Death, the shirt I'm wearing right now. I was doom scrolling. Uh, I think I was playing in Force AD, and it gives you a list of the bands at the bottom. I was doom scrolling. I was like, oh, well, that cover looks cool. Click. Oh, that's fucking actually pretty good, you know? But it does take the joy out of it. So, I don't know. Like, It's I always prefer, a tough one. I just one. prefer like, the old ways. Maybe it's because I'm a 42-year-old stuck in his ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of those. It's... Like we, no, I want to. No, I'm going to change. I'm going to change the course a little bit because we touched upon your books. And so, with your books, you know, when you went into writing them, I know that uh, from your website it shows that you have been very interested in, you know, apocalyptic horror in in a for a lot or apocalyptic fiction in a lot of ways since you were young. Do you think that the appeal of a dystopian future kind of links in with one of the reasons you enjoy um, certain elements of heavy metal, like potentially the the trauma potential element of it or is it the escapism i myself love you know sci-fi and star wars and stuff so i've got an escapism thing i really enjoy as well myself but do you think those are potentially um, interconnected or is there a different reason you believe you are into uh, not only consuming uh, apocalyptic fiction but also writing it i like apocalyptic fiction because of the escapism i don't like contemporary work I can't escape trauma if the trauma is written real time. I don't don't like reading books about death and just nasty shit. If I can relate to it, I 
feel that with the apocalypse, it takes the reality out of it. You step into a speculative world that doesn't exist and it makes it more distant. So the easiest way I can describe it is there's a book out there called On Killing. And it talks about the stages of grief, um, how hard it is to kill someone, how the closer you get to a person to kill them, you know, it goes in the different stages, like shooting a missile, hitting them with your car, shooting them with your gun, up close, choking them. You know, it talks about those differences. Why would I read a book like that? A writer who wants to know about death. It's um, interesting. The macabre intrigues me to clarify. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not uh, wow. shaken by that. Yeah. <laughs> No. But when I'm when I'm reading about real world murder, I just I don't get into it, man. Like I don't want to read a story that could that that has essentially happened, like people recreating just normal everyday homicides. Like I have a high value for human life, um, partly because of these sustained losses I've had over the years. Um, there's so much more I wish I could talk about in this particular subject. I just, I can't do it at this time. Mm-hmm. I have to wait until I am cleared of some of my commitments in life. That's the best way to say it. But really it boils down to not being able to, to relate. If I kill a kid in the apocalypse, it is what it is to me. Like, okay, it's the apocalypse. That didn't really happen. That kid's not real. But when it's, a contemporary novel that takes place in Manhattan and there's a double homicide and a murdered child, it, it hurts me. Like it physically hurts me. I can't get through it. Um, I definitely do not like uh, horror stories that are, that have flooded the fucking indie industry that are just kind of the uh, natural born killers style of story. Like just, brutally cold murderers. I, for one, a lot of writers fuck up the personality types. They just don't understand true sociopath, true sociopaths. They regurgitate what they've seen on TV. How can I explain that? Um, I have had one-on-one interactions with legit sociopaths <laughs> um, and there is a difference and what we see on TV and reading books just doesn't do it for me now there are people out there that are just fucking fucked up why would I want to read about that I just don't that's me my take on it um, nothing against the writers I just don't fucking like it you know I like apocalypse mm-hmm. I, li- I like actually I like space sagas where I'm out in space you know i'm reading a book right now um dead silence i'm on page like 15 i started it last night um it's a it's a space horror it's fucking cool Cool. like it actually seems really cool like i really want to know where this is going but it opened up with a lot of death but it doesn't bother me because it's in another reality so no i I totally understand exactly what you're saying and i want to link in with that is with when it comes to you writing your own books, like what is the actual process? Because obviously you mentioned about, you know, research to a degree, not, not specifically research, but, you know, kind of figuring things out. Like I'm always interested with writers, like how it is. Do you have like notebooks? Do you do it on the computer? Do you have like when you have moments of inspiration you write? Do you make yourself write each evening? Like what's the general process of you yourself creating these uh, these books, these novels? I'm unique. Um, from what I have been told as far as my processes, because I'm, I don't do a lot of front load research. I don't stick to any format. I actually free write my first draft, um, to get the story out. I don't overwrite where I think a lot of authors do, uh, based on a lot of interviews I've read, like a lot of guys, like a lot of authors say, be prepared to delete, you know, a good chunk of your manuscript after you write it because it's too much. I have a problem finding words. Um, my writing is very quick. Uh, it takes me forever to write, but the bringing the story on is very quick. 
Um, I am what there's two types of writers. Uh, I'm sure there's a fucking matrix out there that breaks these writers down even more, but there's uh pantsers and, and um, there are outliners. I hope I got that right. You know, some people like to sit down and write, write outlines, pre-plan their whole book, get everything laid out. Others sit down and write by the seat of their pants. Uh, my novel, uh, a thousand miles to nowhere. I did totally panting. Uh, I might've had pants on maybe sometimes, but I was just writing. Um, I rewrote the book seven times Wow! before I even took it in for edits. And then I edited it, edited it. I had seven edits done here. Let's use that. I have, I had it corrected seven times. Jesus, I cannot talk today, man. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, my process is also, so there was, I'm going to give a shout out to Scott Sigler right now because he says something to me at a book signing that I didn't understand when he was saying it, but I got it later. He said to me, write what you know. And I was like, I can't, man. Like, I'm not allowed. And he's like, dude, no, just write what you know. I was like, I can't. Um, they're going to tell me I can't write that. you know. So I figured it out. It's write what you know. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean what you do for a living. Write what you know. I know trauma. I know hurt, I know pain, I know suffering, and I know how to be creative because I used my creativity to survive as a kid. Um, Hence the story, Michael's Home. That was a story about me as a kid surviving um, in some aspects. Uh, I guess you could call it surviving. Um, But there's a a point in that story. It's a very short story. I wrote it uh, pretty drunk on Memorial Day 2018. Was it 2018? Shit, no. 2016. Memorial Day 2016. Um, there's a there's a point in it where the kid cooks uh, a crawdad in a uh, in a beer can. Well, I did that uh, camping with my dad between fifth and sixth grade. I actually lost my shoes in uh, in the river, and I ended up wearing snow boots the whole school year and got picked on for that. I actually got beat up a few times for having snow boots. Some kid actually took my boot off me and hit me in the head with it a couple times. Oh. Fucking kids were mean in the 90s, man. I thought um, it was going to be a fun story. I'm sorry. I was, no, I was, I was like, oh snow, oh, snow boots in school. That's cool. Oh, no, it's yeah, not. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, nothing I say is ever going to be, like, cheerful. Um, <laughs> dude, when I finished my book, Somebody, uh, when I still had an active Twitter account, somebody tweeted me and goes, um, how do they word it? I don't want to discredit it. I'm not going to get it verbatim, but they basically asked if I was okay. Why would I write a book that sad uh, to get to? I was like, thank you. That was an awesome compliment. Uh, but much like Michael's home, there's a lot of trauma that actually occurred to me in A Thousand Miles to Nowhere. There is a scene specifically in part two that I, I actually did. Um, and that was a breaking point for me. Are we even on the same subject anymore? I feel like I just went right You down. just keep going, keep going. Go um, exactly with, where you're going with this with A Thousand Miles <laughs> to Nowhere, the trauma within, you know, writing, because that's your second novel, wasn't it? Yeah, so, well, I wrote up, so I have published a short story, I have published a novel, and I have published a poem through the Horror Writers Association. It's actually the only piece where I was actually published by somebody else. And the fact that it was the Horror Writers Association is huge. It was the, uh, the poem was called Crumb. And the, it's an ebook done for mental health awareness, go figure. And they published it. It's only available on their website uh, for download. I actually need to get it on my website. I uh, keep meaning to do it, I forget. But it's called of, of Horror and Hope. And I was very happy that they took that poem because I'd never written a poem before. And I got really angry because I couldn't write uh, an anxiety type story. Like they wanted a mental health story and I couldn't write one. I could not come up with a flash piece. So I wrote a poem, didn't edit it. I just sent it to him. I was like, fuck it. They'll either like it or they won't. Everything I've ever sent to anyone has been rejected. So fuck it. They actually got back to me. He's like, we loved it. You're published. I'm like, oh, and then they gave me a check for $5, which to me was huge. First $5 I've ever made on a published piece um you know you know never mind the money i made on my my actual novel which wasn't much at all uh you would think that you know i've sold a couple thousand copies you'd think i mean i didn't make a goddamn thing i think i make like two bucks a book um might be i don't know Uh, i never pay attention i just get my monthly things but yeah man um a lot of trauma 
thrown in my stories. The story, so in my hardcover, there's a, a note said, also published, Confronting Darkness. I actually pulled that story. I didn't publish it. Um, I wanted to rewrite it. Uh, that story uh, has changed concepts several times, and I'm not ready to publish it. So there's that. And then I'm in the process of writing what will essentially be my third novel, but my second novel published. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try and get it published by a big company. I want someone else to pick it up and publish it. Um, publishing my own shit gets expensive, and I'd like somebody else to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, with all of your sort of writing and things, how many projects do you have? Like, Do you have lots of different things going on in like notebooks and et cetera, or no. have you just kind of somewhat focused on these two upcoming things? I don't take notes. Rewriting and the upcoming thing. So once again, I got to give a shout out to um, a certain writer, uh, Jesus Christ. And I forgot his name. This is horrible. Uh, Robert Kirkman, Jesus Christ, maker of Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. I got to have a small conversation with him on a handful of times. And one of the things he says is, yeah, I don't write down my stories or my ideas. I just keep my head. And if they come back, sweet, I'll write them one day. I took that philosophy and um, I don't take notes uh, on what Zero. I yeah, no, zero. Oh, I wow. Just, I mean, I, I know when you said you about the drafts and things, I was like, okay, but no, literally nothing written down. That is incredibly impressive. Zero. Hence the uniqueness. I don't do anything. I write. You know what's also funny? I don't read my stories or listen to my stories or listen to my podcasts after they're done. I don't, I don't do listen it. to my podcasts. Yeah, I, 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 I do not do that. <laughs> nope, I don't. I I send it to my editor. I said, "Fix what you need to fix." Add the intro, the outro. Put my thing on the bottom. Load it to fucking YouTube, and I will do the rest. But yeah, no, I don't take notes, man. It's pointless. I know what stories I want to write. I've got mm. about. 15 or so stories in my head right now. I came up with another one last night. It's actually a spinoff of, a, of an original concept I have. Um, it's a space story, um, but it's also apocalyptic. Everything I write will have themes in the apocalypse, themes in family values, because it's huge to me. Uh, because as a parent, I believe we should give everything for our children, fucking everything. If that means I am to suffer 10 lifetimes over, guess fucking what? I'm going to suffer. Um, there was another thing. Uh, being open with mental health awareness. Um, I like exposing my trauma. Uh, to me, it's healthy. So I'm going to give another shout out because I love giving people credit where credit is due. Um, some people may know who I'm talking about. Others might not. I got to work with um, the Latrell brothers when I was on my last deployment. I met Morgan first and I met Marcus second. Um, but Morgan had come home from a firefight and had said something to me. And by home, I mean back to base uh, from a firefight had said something to me that was told to him, which is in general, when bad shit happens, we should talk about it. I, dude, that stuck to me. And I can't thank him enough for that. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of any of that shit. For one, it wasn't my firefight. Two, it's not my story to tell. And honestly, I don't know if he wants me talking about it. But he did say that to me. And I'm not going to take that away because it's true. We should talk about it. Not talking about it only makes things worse. So I love talking about it 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 makes people uncomfortable as fuck sometimes but guess what i'm gonna talk about it if you don't like it walk the fuck away or tell me kindly dude uh no oh, okay do mm, understood um i just i'm going to tell you things that you probably don't want to fucking hear i just it's how i am i'm going to say it i expose myself for all the bullshit that's happened to me why I keep that shit in why um, it, all it did was hurt me. It caused me to have a fucking mental breakdown that I almost didn't come back from. Like it was bad, man. It was bad. So I talk about it now. I'm very much so. And the podcast helps you with that as well, because, you know, one of the things I found about as a podcast, you know, when you start it, you think, yeah, that'll like, when you think of starting, you've got a, a degree of an idea in your head. And then as soon as you record the first episode, it's, it's very different to how, 
you kind of imagined it. And I've had friends of mine who I've had on the show who haven't been on podcasts and things before. And they're always beforehand, they're a little bit nervous. And I'm like, it's just a conversation. You know, once you get into it and you forget everything's being recorded, really, it's just, it's a natural thing. And, you know, I've been doing this for uh, six years now. And it's one of those things that I've learned, which is nowadays, especially because there are so many distractions, there is not as much, or people don't make as much time to just chat you know just to focus and and tune out everything else and just kind of hone in and i think that speaking about your emotions and your feelings and things in a constructive healthy way is amazing and with a podcast especially where it's episodic especially when you're the host you can kind of drip feed the audience bits and pieces of yourself at a pace without necessarily having to offload everything in one go so have you found that with your podcast so the episode i filmed last night i think i i got closer uh, I don't like my first two episodes very much. Um, the people I interviewed are fucking amazing humans, man. Um, uh, I actually work closely with, uh, Elijah from Dismal Lyrics daily. Um, he is truly becoming a, an amazing friend of mine. And I, I, I have a hard time picturing life kind of without him on the other end of my phone. I've never met him in person, but he has been such an awesome human being. Um, Those two cat pods just you can tell I'm I'm new, but I'm never gonna change them. I'm not gonna take them down. Uh I want people to see them. And even though I think I'm on, I think I just episode nine technically, which would be episode eight of the normal stuff, but episode nine because I had a fan episode in there. Last night it just went so fucking well, man. Like I just found my groove. I figured out how to kind of introduce the pod and break into discussion, make it sound natural. It's not scripted. So I don't have pre thought out questions. Like I literally just listen to their music, ask them to come on, and then we talk. Um, and we kind of go from there. And I tell them up front, like, hey, this isn't scripted. It's going to get weird. Uh, I'm going to forget what I'm talking about. And we're just going to make it work. So last night went really well. And I think I'm getting it. Just like with writing, um, my book, it took me till about part two before I really got my groove. And you can see it when you read it. Like you can tell there it's, I, I found my groove in part two. Oddly enough, I started writing part two after I went to college. Um, I stopped writing because I did not know what the fuck I was doing. I actually went to college, got a degree in fucking English lit and taught myself the basics. Um, yeah. So I went back to my book and finished writing. I think after school, because I was getting up at like four in the morning to do it. And then I was just staying till midnight and then going to a day job that worked way over 10 hours a day. Like if the math doesn't add up, there's a reason for that. I did not have enough time in a day. I would literally be up for fucking 30 something hours sometimes and be like, I need more Red Bull and bangs. Um, sweating my ass off. My blood pressure's up to here. I'm like, fuck, anybody get me? Hey, fucking squirrel! <laughs> you turtle, fuck! You know, um, <laughs> but you know, fucking, uh, yeah. I think I got. I think I'm getting it. Um, there's always going to be improvement. Uh, just like with my writing, um, it's a constant revision. Uh, this this book I'm writing uh, right now, uh, the the one that I'm hoping to have picked up early next year, I did an outline for the first time. But there's still a bit of pantser in me. The outline is more of like a, a spine. Like I just work around it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those with all of the creative endeavors that you have and the passions that you have as well, they all intertwine with obviously what you mentioned about honesty and it's expression. Your know, music's about expression and honesty. And all of these things are vessels of ways for you to show the world who you are in a variety of different mediums or allow them to kind of look into themselves as well which i think is really telling and it's really important it, it's just something that you know honesty is it's so undervalued i think in so many different ways and that's why i think certain music to me is i, I find to be quite disingenuous uh, because it's just that with with writing in itself there's a degree of you that has to go down on the page and you have to kind of translate your own thoughts onto paper. And the fact that you do that, and as well as when you interview people, you don't have that kind of plan, just kind of shows the with you going with the flow and trusting your own instincts. So I want to ask, have you, 
I know this will probably link into things that you can't specifically talk about and things, but with your instincts in themselves, linking with your honesty, have you always been an honest individual and have you been sort of following your instincts correctly over the years or has it taken time to kind of learn and navigate through that? Granted, no one is perfect. <laughs> so. Oh no, dude, I was, I was not always an honest person. Um, I stole so much as a kid. Um, I would steal CDs. I would steal food. Um, I, I had to, I had to steal food at times. Um, but no, I was a very dishonest kid. Like I, I, I fucking, I did some stupid shit and I'm very fortunate that I didn't get into any real trouble. Um, you know, we've, we, every, there's not a fucking person out here who hasn't lied, 100%, you, know? 100%. you know, whether it's an exaggeration of a true event or just fucking lie, we've all done it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no, I haven't always been honest. Uh, I think coming to terms with myself and realizing that the lack of honesty in our society as a whole right now with all the bullshit you see everywhere like you cannot look at a screen or read something that honestly you don't fucking know if it's real anymore like what is real so to me what is real is me i am becoming for myself the most real version of myself i can be uh don't overread that somebody's gonna be he said that he can be that he could possibly be that means he's not no don't overread that we are all going to hold back a little, you know, I cannot wait for the day where I can get on here and tell everyone exactly everything that has built up to this point in my life. There's just one aspect of my life that I want to talk about so bad that would help me heal so much. I just can't do it yet. And I'm working toward that. And it's not that I don't want to, I just fucking can't. I, I can't. I have to think about my family as a whole. I have to provide for them. If I lose my job, I have no fucking money. <laughs> so I won't have the money to support my podcast and my passions and pay for food and shit. I refuse to do that. When I was a kid, I used to have to wipe my ass with my fucking homework because we didn't have toilet paper. But my parents had booze, fucking heroin, crack. And cigarettes. Explain that to me. Yes, I had a house over my head, which my younger brother at one point did not, which my sister at one point did not. I'm the oldest of seven, I think. Um, it got worse. And I'm not going to tell their stories. It got worse after I left. Now, I had my fair share early on in life. So I focus on that. But yeah, no, I, I I followed in the footsteps of the people I was around. I was a very dishonest human. I lied about shit I did in the military because I didn't want people to see me as less than my ego was. Like I was chasing my fucking ego. I, I was chasing my ego up until about a year ago. I finally said, fuck it. Um, you know, like, dude, I just, I, I stopped chasing my ego and just got humble with myself. And I've talked about this with a few of my friends. I've talked about it with my wife, you know, like it's gotta be me, man. So only way to do that is talk about shit. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Take back. <laughs> no, well, it's, it's one of those, it's, you know, your life experience comes from your mistakes as well as your standard experiences that aren't necessarily classed as mistakes, but every, every element of life has its own complex set of challenges. And the way that you're trying to show to the world, kind of what you've learned from there i think is commendable in all that you do in your in your writing and in your podcast and just in your general expression and i think it is inspiring for someone you know to have gone through the kind of things that you have touched upon there and to come out the other side still with you know the honest and positive outlook and still trying to be a force for change and you know your podcast although you will find yourself to have some uh, benefits from doing it because it's it's doing a podcast is something that i find for my own mental health and creative output is incredible for me you will find the same as you're already finding, not to mention the benefit you're putting out to the rest of the world as well. So to wrap up here, is there any sort of final words you want to say uh, specifically about um, your podcast? Specifically with the podcast, mm-hmm. I just really want people to stop seeing someone, including themselves, as 
when they get mental health treatment as weak. Um, I struggled with that. I refused to get mental health treatment. I refused to acknowledge I had PTSD. I refused to acknowledge I was depressed and had anxiety. Uh, I refused it because I didn't want to be seen as weak. And a big part of that was I was chasing my ego. Uh, There's a big stigma in my, my field that if you get mental health treatment, you're fucking broken human. You're not broken. You're just, you've sustained a shit ton of stress. So I want people to know it's okay. Like, dude, we're all fucked up. Like there's no one out there that's not fucked up except for the kids. We need to salvage that innocence as long as you can. But to do that, you got to take care of yourself first. So get the treatment you need. I did. It was fucking great. I took five months off work. Fucking said bye. If I if I couldn't get treatment for myself, I wasn't going to be around to do the work, to pay the bills, to fend for my family. Like I had to. I I, I hit a wall. So I went. I I want people to get the fucking help they need at whatever means possible. And the only way I know how to do that is by telling my story and having people that we generally look up to tell their stories. Because if they can get on there and do it, and I can get up here, I'm just a fucking somebody, like it's a random fucking dude. Why can't you? And I had one goal. I just wanted one fucking person to get help. And that happened almost immediately. I had somebody actually reach out to me and say, thank you, David. You gave me the inspiration I needed to get help. And I am now. Dude, fucking made my heart. Like after, I think it was after the second episode. I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. That's how much people needed to hear it. You know, I've only got 72 subscribers, but I'll tell you what, I think everyone who has subscribed and everyone who has listened has got a little something out of it. And that's what I want. I want people to benefit from my bullshit. I want people to benefit from the bullshit of others. That's it. I mean, that, that's incredible. I wish I'd asked you about the books first because then it would have made that ending was absolutely fantastic. But with the, the books and everything else you've got going on, you know, tell everyone else on top of everything you've been saying, just any last notes of where people can find you, the releases you've got, where they can start with your sort of writings, just the kind of you know, plug yourself in front of everyone. And oh, that's a fucking Lily. I am shaming. <laughs> um, it's just David Kirkus.com. I have a website. Uh, I need to do some work on it, but you can get my books there. You can um, link to my podcast. There podcast is called we are melomaniacs real quick. I fucked it up. My first two episodes, I called it. We are melomanic because I originally wanted it to be the title. We are melomanic melomanic you know just like the idea of like mental health and music well when i had the logo design i had it designed as melomaniac yeah well oops i can't spell i have a fucking editor for that um and i didn't have spell check so i kept with the melomaniac i actually like it and it it goes pretty well too but yeah so you can find me there um i'm on youtube right now uh my editor hasn't been able to get my videos converted for uh soundcloud so we can distribute to spotify or apple yet but it's going there i do have two videos up on soundcloud right now episode one episode two so you can go there and watch them but yeah just my website david com or we are melomaniacs on youtube wonderful well thank you once again uh, for speaking with me and for all of the you know positive energy you're putting out into the world you know taking down some of the misconceptions around heavy music and death metal including as as well as some of the misconceptions around sort of mental health and trauma and speaking about it and as you say you you know at least one person that you have helped but i'm sure you've helped many already and i'm sure there are many more that you're going to help and even myself who has not been through uh, the degree of extreme trauma that you have mentioned, you know, your podcasts have still really touched me and meant a lot to me in a lot of ways. So I really appreciate just as a fan, as well as a, a fellow creator to thank you for uh, putting that out there. It, uh, it means a lot. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. No worries at all. Anytime.